Okay. Just about everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So this this is a clinical lab assistant, CLI. Clinical laboratory assistant. Certification. Now, what is the difference between a clinical laboratory technician and a clinical laboratory assistant? Okay, a clinical laboratory technician has four years of college. They have a Bachelor of Science degree and they are the ones that work in the laboratories at the microscopes and at the uh, laboratory stations where the blood is spinning down. They're the ones that are responsible for catching the phlebotomist's errors or the pre-analytical errors. When you draw blood and let's say you hemolyze the blood instead of inverting it, you shake it, right? We said that we hemolyze and rupture the red blood cells. It would cause an artificial elevation in a lot of the analytes, particularly your what? Electrolytes, right? So, or if you drew out of order. When you draw out of order, and let's say you use potassium 2, K2, EDTA2, before you use a serum separator 2, and you hemolyze that blood, then what's going to happen is if you draw potassium 2, EDTA, or lavender before a uh, serum separator 2, and then on top of that you take the serum separator and you hemolyze the blood, we're going to have a really high elevation of potassium because of that. So they or they're the ones that catch the small nuances. The machines that they use are also calibrated for error functions to catch that. But you only have one or two set of eyes to catch the phlebotomist errors. And a lot of times the phlebotomist errors go unchecked, which is why you have to have your code of ethics and your, your level of integrity when you work. A clinical laboratory assistant basically is the assistant of the clinical laboratory technician. So they're kind of like the person that runs the errands for the medical laboratory technician. They're the person that makes sure all of the quality control logs are up to date. Uh, they're the individual that checks the refrigerator for the correct temperature, 42 and below. Between 38 and 42 degrees should be the temperature for specimens. Um, they're the ones that go through the log books to check that all of the machines have been calibrated and tested. So all machines that are used in the laboratory usually have a high and a low solution, like for your glucometers. We have a high sugar test and a low sugar test to be sure that the machine is, is, is calibrated correctly. If you open a solution in the laboratory, your solutions should be labeled immediately upon opening, labeled with your initials, and the date that you opened it, because all solutions that are used for calibration are only good 90 days after they're been opened. Okay, so you need to check dates and expiration dates. Typically, when you get a batch of labs in that are what we call point of care testing, which means that you can do them, you don't have to have a specialized degree to do these labs, and I'll show you some of them. Um, that you log in the, um, the code on the box, you log in uh, you know, the uh, manufacturer's code, you also log in the date that they arrived, keep the temperature of the refrigerator, uh, always monitor that. And Every week or every month, depending on the protocol of the laboratory, you will run a test to be sure of the efficacy of the, uh, the batch that came in, okay? So quality control logs are a real important part of a clinical laboratory assistant's job. Not only keeping the lab clean, but also keeping the quality control logs up to date. Now, what is a quality control log? A little bit about what we just talked about. Basically, you'll have a list of all of the lab tests that the lab does and the machines. A calibration of each of the machines may require that you use a sample and you test it. A lot of times they'll have sample solutions with comparable analytes to that of blood and or blood sugar. They'll have a high, they'll have a low, and this way the machines will be, you'll be able to calibrate.
calibrate them to be sure that they're working properly. When you do a test, typically you will put in the, the date, the time, the test lot number, the expiration date, the control kit lot number, and you'll be filling these in on either a daily basis or weekly basis. So for instance, uh, a PT-INR ratio. We have a PT-INR machine. Remember PT-INR? That's in the lavender top tubes. We also have a portable machine that nurses and phlebotomists take to people's homes. And we do a finger stick to test what their PT-INR ratio is, okay? So we have daily logs through Garden City Diagnostics. Uh, and each of these logs have to show that the machines have passed for each of the analytes that they test. Okay, some of the point of care testing that Garden City Diagnostic Labs has is TSH, which is what? Your thyroid stimulating hormone, right? We test, we can do stool cultures. And the stool cultures that we do are for blood. We do microhematocrit. Okay. We do a lipid profile. We do urine testing for drugs and or sugar. Um, we do alcohol testing, and we do HIV, AIDS testing. And I'm going to show you how we do that. Um, so these are just a few of the tests that are run, what we call point of care through Garden City Diagnostic Laboratories. Uh, these are small machines that can be operated by the lay person, but yet, you know, if people want to have results, they can come up and do that, okay? Uh, what I'd like to begin with is some of the chemicals that you'll find in a laboratory can be very dangerous, okay? You have to know something about that. I have a material safety data sheet here that I brought in, and have you ever heard of those material safety data sheets? Yes. Okay, do you know what they are? Yes. What are they? They will give you the breakdown of the chemical. Um, they will talk about the, how the chemical originated, what it's com com composed of, um, uh, all different types of facts and things regarding to that. Like, should it get splashed on you? What do you have to do to clean it up? To try to it control? What are the things you have to do based on the actual chemical that you're dealing with? Correct. Very good, Kelly. Thank you. So yeah, material safety data sheet. Uh, usually these are hanging up by the materials or by the eyewash sink. Typically they're all hanging in an area. They're encased in plastic for everyone to be able to see. You need to know what kind of chemicals you're dealing with because a chemical spill could be immediately dangerous to life and health. Now some of the chemicals that you may find in a laboratory because you're in charge of storing those. So the chemicals that you'll find in the laboratory are methanol. Uh, you'll find uh, diluted acids, phosphoric, hydrochloric, sulfuric. When I say diluted acids, they're not that diluted. They can still burn a hole through your skin anytime you deal with acids have to be very careful. Most of these bottles are stored in a, uh, in a cool area, dark area. They're in um, smoke colored, kind of an amber type glass, very heavy bottles. We don't store except in bottles. You don't see too much, you won't see anything stored in plastic usually. Uh, acetone, ether, or dimethyl ether. Um, 
you'll see acids, you'll see bases, potassium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide. Bases and acids on the spectrum of the pH scale, both very dangerous, very caustic. Okay? Um, certain spills, if you have a spill in the lab, you need to know how to clean it up. Like for acids, typically we use um, you know, baking soda, sand. Uh, you don't, you want to absorb it and keep the spill from moving. But if it's a very strong acid, depending on the molarity of the acid, by the time you clean it up, your olfactory senses can be burned because acid, acid, smelling acid will burn your, take your breath away. So you have to be careful as to when to actually exit and make sure everyone else gets out as well. Um, because acids, depending on the amount that's spilled, can be very, very dangerous to you. Um, methanol. Methanol is a uh, very flammable alcohol. It is very low molecular weight and a very high flammability and a, and a very low auto ignition temperature. Actually, I have the material safety data sheet for methanol right here. And it's also known as carbonyl or wood alcohol. Typically, methanol is a nice drying agent because it dries out and evaporates so quickly. If you take a match and put methanol in a Petri dish, and you light the match and put it in, it flames blue, and then it just evaporates. But if you take a match to propane or diesel, you put a match in, the match will go out. It won't even burn. And it, when it does burn, it burns for a very long period of time. Kind of like the way you have the oil wicks and gas lamps because those types of molecules are very long chain molecules and extremely heavy in, you know, kilodaltons. And so it takes a while for them to burn out. Whereas methanol is a very light molecule um, and it's very, very flammable. Why? This is why most of the labs are kept cool. You know, it's just like there's a lot of machines running in there, so there are a lot of them are computerized, all are computerized, so it has to be the temperature is lower than what you would find in the normal hospital rooms. So labs are kept very cool. Um, the methanol is a one carbon molecule and with an OH attached to it, which makes it very light, um, very flammable. The, uh, to give you an idea, uh, the emergency overview is this product is clear, volatile, flammable, has a slight alcoholic odor, highly flammable. Vapors may form explosive mixtures with the air. The product causes irritation of the eye, skin, and mucous membranes, toxic by inhalation. In contact with skin, toxic by inhalation, in contact with skin, and is swallowed. Methanol can cause blindness, causes headaches, drowsiness, and other effects to the central nervous system. Do not allow this product to contact eye, skin, and clothing. Do not breathe vapor. So you need to be aware of the different chemicals that you'll be dealing with in a laboratory scenario because being unaware of these chemicals puts you at great risk, right? And, and physical, uh, physical risk. So with that being said, you need to know what to do to protect yourself. So, the, of course, they have eye wash baths, they have neoprene gloves that you put on to handle some of the chemicals. They have, uh, you know, masks that you can wear. So you need to know how to store them as well. So certain chemicals cannot be stored together if they're reactive with one another, okay? Like organohalides. And, and acids or organohalides and bases. Those cannot be stored together. So I'm going to pass this around. Um, before I do that, I just want to give you the, uh, the temperatures that it has a flash point of 52 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, 52 degrees isn't that warm, right? It's considered even chilly by some, I maybe mean, not Michigan, but you know, for some people, 52 degrees isn't considered warm. Well, what a flash point means is when there's a source of heat near the methanol, it will 
flash. It will burn in 52 degrees. Okay? Now, the auto ignition temperature, where it will auto ignite, is 867 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, basically, what that means, if there's a, let's say, God forbid, there was a fire, and the temperature got up to, in an area near, near the uh, methanol, to 867 degrees Fahrenheit, it would automatically ignite. Okay, so just in, in the heat can ignite it without a flame source, without a source of flame. Um, to extinguish, you would use the carbon dioxide or dry chemical. So not everything gets put out with water. Okay, that's where you get into your fire hazard, uh, your fire diamonds. Okay, in case of spill, containment procedures. Use protective, personal protective equipment or PPEs. Ensure adequate ventilation. Remove all sources of ignition. Stop the flow of material if this is without risk. So you cannot put yourself in a situation, I mean, spilling maybe maybe a couple of ounces of methanol, we can clean that up. Spilling an entire gallon of methanol means that you need to get everybody out of the room and close the room, put towel at the base of the door, and call the hazmat people to come in. And I'm going to explain to you why this is. Um, I'll, let you, I'll pass this around. First of all, if you have an enclosed room, and let's say you have a, let's say the lab is down here, and you have a, you have a room offset in the basement here, when you spill something like methanol, the fumes are heavier than air. So what it does is it displaces the oxygen instead with methanol. So you know how you how they say when you're in, if there's a dangerous situation and there's a fire, get go low. Go low. Yeah. Going low here will kill you. Because there is no more oxygen. It's displaced all of the oxygen. Notice how low we are. Okay? So the lower, the farther down you are in the laboratory, if, if, if it's sloped and there's a, it's an enclosed area, even with ventilation, the first couple of feet is all going to be displaced with methanol, okay? Now, so the oxygen is going up. The methanol displaces the oxygen or any of your uh, petroleum-based compounds. Their fumes are heavier than oxygen. And on top of that, when they displace the oxygen, fumes in the air become very susceptible to any source of ignition. So if you, you know, God forbid, you know, you've got a lighter in your pocket or something, you accidentally touch it, that may be enough spark to just light off all the fumes in the air, and it travels. So you need to make sure if it's a large enough spill, or even if you're in doubt, get everybody out of the lab and call the hazmat team to come and clean up, okay? So this becomes in a situation that's immediately dangerous to life and health. Immediately dangerous to life and health. You're, you're not going to survive a spill like that unless you know you have you have special equipment on. Self-contained breathing apparatus, right? So you're gonna you, you want to be aware. Diluted acids, uh, acetone, also uh, uh, very flammable. Dimethyl ether, extremely flammable. And what a lot of the uh, a lot of the uh, laboratory technologists use the acetone, the dimethyl ether, and the methanol for is to clean out the, uh, the beakers, the containers, the Erlenmeyer flasks. Once they wash it and it's sterilized, a lot of times they'll, they'll uh, put uh, some of these chemicals like the methanol or dimethyl ether and they'll put it under a hood and it dries everything out really quickly, the water and everything. So that gets dried out. So you need to be aware of the chemicals around you while you're working in a laboratory. Notwithstanding, of course, one of the most dangerous and hazardous uh, compounds known to man is blood. You're working with
with a lot of blood. You're centrifuging blood. That's part of your job. Uh, you might be preparing the microscopes. You might be putting slides <coughs> under the microscope for the uh, laboratory technician. So you have lots of different jobs. A lot of times they multitask clinical laboratory assistants to do blood draws as well. So this is a very handy certification to have for you because in addition to drawing blood, you'll be competent enough to be able to work in a laboratory as an assistant. Okay. So one of the first things I would like to do is start out with uh, urine drug screening. Here at Garden City Diagnostic Labs, we use what we call a 10-panel drug screen. And it goes over 10 different drugs in the body system. So before you go to your externship, we would ask that you come and do a drug test with us if you're going to through our school for an externship. Typically, we give the uh, participant or the patient or the student, if they're doing a drug test, a cup. These cups are sealed. You watched me take the seal off. We give you gloves also to go into the bathroom to do this. Now, whether you're doing a clean catch urine specimen or you're just doing a drug screen, it's always important, well, more important, I guess, for the clean catch to clean the urinary meatus prior to urinating. And to do that, you would want to give to the, um, to the uh, patient some uh, aloe wipes that clean away any excess bacteria that might be covering the urinary meatus, and also for the man, if he's doing a clean catch urine, to clean around the opening of the penis. Uh, usually I give them two or three wipes. You instruct them to wipe downward with one, and then around, and then around. So that when they do do any type of urine test, we usually ask for a midstream clean catch specimen which means as they begin urinating, they'll open this up after they've cleaned, and this is why you want gloves. A lot of places don't give you gloves. And then as you're urinating, as the stream is going into the, the toilet, you put the cup under the stream. So you're not catching the first stream, you're catching the midstream, and that's what they call a midstream clean catch. So it's very important that you talk to your patients about how to pr properly clean the area before they urinate in the cup, okay? and they have to lay there. For a drug test, this is rather interesting because these are very nice drug screen cards. And I have the students just, I show them how to do it, and I have them take it to the restroom. These are uh, uh, a silicon, uh, they're desiccating agents. A desiccating agent simply absorbs any moisture and prevents uh, the test from losing its efficacy through uh, typical humidity. I'm not sure, Dave, if you can get a close-up of this. Tell me when to stop. How close are we? Can you see this? Should I come closer or no? We're good. This is the drug card. You'll notice that there are five tests on one side, and if you turn it around, there are five tests on the other side. Okay? To know whether someone is negative, you have to see two lines appear. One is a test line, the other line indicates negative for that particular compound that you're testing. Even if it's a faint, faint line, it's still considered negative. If there's only one line, which is the test line, that indicates that they're positive for that particular uh, drug. This, a line at the bottom and no line on top or no lines at all indicates that it's an invalid test and we have to do it again. So two lines is negative, one line is positive, okay? And these tests for barbiturates, opiates, THC, it tests for uh, methadone, it tests for um, uh, what do you call it, as, uh, amphetamines, methamphetamines, benzodiazepines, I said barbiturates. So there, there's, uh, there's lots of different uh, chemicals that this 10 panel drug screen goes over. Uh, it is for ecstasy. So what I teach my students is once they urinate in a cup to open this up 
And you'll see that there's these black squiggly lines on each of these oh, sticks. Now these black squiggly lines tell us not to dip the stick in past the black squiggly line. So if this were filled with urine, they would take this and dip it into the urine just at the tip of the black line. Hold it for about 10 seconds, then shake it off, and then cover it like so, and then lie it flat on some paper towel for about 10 minutes and let it set. What will happen is through capillary action through the porous paper, the urine will be absorbed upward, and if the drug is in the body, if they have any of these drugs in the body, it will show, of course, just the one line. Okay? It'll ablate the <coughs> God bless you. So I'm going to pass this around. Obviously, you've got ID, date, initials. That would be the initials of the individual uh, running the test. So let me go ahead and pass this around. And these are used through, uh, throughout the entire um, industry of uh, drug testing. Also, you want to know that any time that you're doing drug testing on a patient, a customer, whomever, before you can read that drug test, they need to be able to have consent. They need to know what you're doing, right? Because that's part of the rights of patients. Patients' rights, safety, privacy, comfort, dignity. So at phlebotomy career training, when our students come in to do drug tests for their clinical externship, we have them sign a drug consent form. Once they sign that, then they're giving us permission to test their urine. For Garden City Diagnostics, this is the form that we fill out. This is the 10 panel drug screen. You'll notice we have THC, MDMA, we have cocaine, opiates, PCP, amphetamines, methamphetamines, benzodiazepines, barbiturates, and uh, you know forms of morphine or methadone, which is used to be given out a long time ago in clinics for heroin addicts to have a more sterile way of you know not going into uh, withdrawals. They would have methadone clinics, and I know. I've heard that, unfortunately, uh, heroin is making a resurgence in the United States. So it's very sad. Um, but some places can do uh, five panel drug screens. Uh, the panels differ, <coughs> but most of the time they're looking for the same. We find that the 10 panel is most comprehensive. Okay, so I'll pass these around so you can look at them. We were doing probation testing with uh, the Garden City uh, Circuit Court and they, they would have people come down to see us at Garden City Diagnostic for drug and alcohol testing. Unfortunately, we stopped doing that um, because these people, when we schedule them for tests, wouldn't show. And they would they try to come in at all different hours and I didn't want to be responsible for reporting to their probation officer because they were late. So I, I just didn't want to have that responsibility. Not only that, You'll find that when you're doing probation testing, if you do get into probation testing, um, which is a possibility with your certifications, keep in mind that because pe if regardless of what people are arrested for, if, they, they're, if they're using a substance, incarceration doesn't help people get better. It doesn't treat the underlying sickness of, of abuse or drug abuse or self-medicating. Um, so it's not, um, you know, it, so having somebody who's nice on the probation side sometimes is, that it is, is helpful for people. So respect people regardless of whatever, they, whatever their uh, reasons are for being in the system. No, just pass them around, look at them. Oh, okay. Just so you can see. And this is a temperature log. So you can take a look at this temperature log. That's what this is. Okay. So are there any questions on a drug screen? Does anybody want to do one?
I mean, it'll count towards your. Uh, I'll do, I'll do what? what? It'll count towards your clinical externship, and it's free of charge. I'll do what? You want to do it? Okay, Miss Kelly. Yeah. And we're gonna we're gonna get that. Um, so there's some gloves um, right over there, and I'm gonna go ahead and give this to you. And then you've already opened up that opened up that container. Yeah, but we're not going for sterile. There's no oh. there's no drugs. Do you want me to can you touch it? If you like, it's up to you. I have one. But just go ahead and uh, do that. And then when you're done, well, I'm not, I was going to dip this. I was going to show you the dip. You want me to dip it? Yeah, no, that'd be great if you could do that. Okay. Come and show us how you dip it. I love it. That would be great. Can I show you how I dip it? Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Miss Kelly's going to go ahead and do that. Thank you, Miss Kelly. Okay. Okay. So. How would you how would you interact with somebody that you see as positive for uh, any of those drugs? What are some of the things that you would have to ask to them? Uh, excuse me, one moment. Okay, so what if somebody's positive for barbiturates? What if somebody's positive for opiates? I'd ask if they're on any prescription. Ask if they're on any prescription meds, right? So if any of our students turn out to be positive ask them if they have prescription meds. Can they show us the prescription that's in their name that's not expired? So one of the things we look for is that the prescription is not had, has not expired two months ago. Okay? If they can show that to us, then we're fine. Okay? So uh, I had one lady during probation testing. Um, she came out positive for so many things, but she had a polypharmacy. She opened her purse and took out all her pills. It looked like a pharmacy. And I had to write each and every prescription down mm -hmm. for the edification of her probation officer so they wouldn't, you know, she wouldn't get in trouble. So uh, please keep that in mind. You know, respect them with no different way. Uh, what I have here next, let's do some simple fun tests here. This is a lot of fun. Uh, this is like a, a breathalyzer. Come on down. We're going to have you use this area right here, Ms. Kelly. And so go ahead, Kelly's going to go ahead and do her urine dip stick. So we're going to just thank her and watch her while she does that. So she's opening it up. And I don't go to above the don't black line. Don't go above the black line. So just hold it in the urine for about 10 seconds. Immerse it right above, right to the black line. Just go ahead and immerse it. 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000, 6, 1,000, 7, 1,000, 8, 1,000, 8, 1,000. 10, 1,000, now take it out, just <coughs> dry it there. And I'll just set it flat, there you go, and you can throw that out away. Thank you so much. That was so nice. So now we're just gonna let that set, and then we'll focus on it as soon as, give it a few minutes to, uh, to, to work. What I'm gonna show you next, this is a digital breathalyzer. Obviously, in probation testing, they have the big breathalyzers, they grab a straw, they put the straw in the machine, and they blow. This one's a little bit different. You can actually buy these at Walgreens, CVS. These are two different types of breathalyzers. This one actually comes with a little adapter that allows you to put purse your lips over it and blow. This one accommodates only the air that somebody would blow into uh, into the machine right here. So this is a little less scientific. Uh, obviously, what would set these off as positive? <laughs> what do you think would set these off as positive? Alcohol on the breath. Do I? Alcohol on the breath. Alcohol on the breath. What's another? Where, if you're not an alcoholic, how else could this turn positive? What can you use in the morning that might turn mouthwash. into mouthwash? Yeah, sometimes we have alcohol-based mouthwash, right? And uh, also, you would never do what? Clean these with what? Alcohol. Alcohol. Alcohol wipes, right? <laughs> so watch. It's going to count down. When it gets to zero, I'm going to go ahead and blow right here. How accurate is that? Uh, let's, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, when it gets down and counts down to one, I'm going to take a deep breath and I'm going to try to aim my breath here. And it's kind of hard to aim. 
Alright, here we go. And now it's going to pop down. It's going to tell me whether or not. Okay. should say something. It's processing. I don't know. The light is on. The battery is almost down on this one as well. This one, it'll probably pop something up. This one's a little bit different. Okay, this is going to count down. See this little hole right here? Well, this is where we have these plastic adapters. So, anybody want to blow? Kelly, get ready, count down, blow. That was good. There's some strong lungs there. And then it'll give you a read. 0, 0.00. Yeah, she had a drink. <laughs> uh -huh. so, I don't know why this is doing that. Let's reset it. Do it anyway. So anyways, you can pass that around if you guys want to use that. It's kind of fun. Now, these can be, um, these are actually accepted. Um, it, this will pick up alcohol on your breath. It really will. So if you have alcohol on your breath and you blow into one of will those. Will it pick up your gum? Gum on your breath? No. I have a gum. Gum, there's no alcohol in gum. I don't believe. I don't think so. That's a good idea, though. I have a gum. That's a good idea. To put alcohol is a good idea for who? It should all be a little bit. It will. Oh, well, then mine will be positive. Okay. Well, that's a good, that's a good, uh, uh, example. Zero. So that'll be good. Let's see how we're doing here. Because I'm on I'm on Ativine, but I didn't, that's it. Like, yep. Ativine, that's <laughs> a, a benzodiazepine. <laughs> Ativine is like a benzodiazepine. Well, that's what it is. Yep. Doctor prescribed. I'm just saying. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. She <laughs> said she, um, she said she popped the ecstasy on break. Dave, no. okay. Dave, can you zero in on this? Wait, I'm, gonna hold, I'm gonna hold this up. Okay, so. One of our students graciously provided this for us. As you can see, under the third one, there is no second line, which indicates a positive reaction for a prescribed medication, in her case, uh, of a benzodiazepine. Uh, everything else, even this one, is a very faint line, but there is still a line there. So even though it's faint, it would still be negative. Okay, and as you can see, we have the neg we have negative all across the board, where the second line is very clear. But again, even if the line is slightly there and very faint, it's still considered negative. So I want to thank you for that. And we'll just, I'll just discard this if you don't mind. Did you want to see it? I did. Yeah, here. This is cool. Okay, continuing onward. So you're done with the issue. Probably oh, he's back. Okay, what I'm going to show you next, what I'm going to show you next is, okay, this is an AIDS test card. This is made by Trinity Biotech. It's the Unigold uh, Recombinogen HIV. Now, people can come to our school we're through, we're through Garden City Diagnostics. We do HIV testing. It's totally anonymous. It's $70 if somebody wants to come and get an HIV test. Uh, people can actually purchase these. The efficacy of these are very high. Even though a positive test for HIV does not necessarily mean that they've seroconverted, it means that they have to go for further testing and they should see their doctor. Because the only way to tell if someone's seroconverted to their T cells drop below 200 is by a Western blot. Okay, that's a particular test. It's considered, it's called a Western blot test. And those tests are the only proof positive that somebody is positive for HIV. Okay, but these are good 
to help relieve um, people's fears in case that they think they might be HIV. This is a, a nice, a good and first. A swab. No, actually, this is a blood test. This is a finger stick. And I'm going to show you how this works. Now, to do these, like we were talking about your quality control logs and how your quality control logs have to be kept up to date. When we get a batch of these in, they have to be logged into the quality control log. The date, the, the manufacturer, the lot number, all those have to be logged in and we have to do a test. Let me shut this off. Let me shut it off. We have to do a test to be sure that these, that the high and the low, the negative and the positive are both working, correct? So what's interesting is that when you open these up and you take them out, it's just a little card. Look at that. It's just very tiny. This is the Trinity BioGold HIV test. So how do we test somebody for HIV? We know how to do finger sticks, right? It's just a basic mm -hmm. finger stick. You go two millimeters into the skin with the lancet after you've cleaned it, wipe away the first drop of blood because that contains tissue plasminogen. And then, what do we do? Well, you can't just drop the blood on here. You first have to prime this with some sterile saline. So you have to prime the, uh, the actual paper itself so that when the blood touches it, it has a solution to be able to uh, diffuse into and mm -hmm. climb up through capillary action. So the saline, the sterile saline, acts as that medium of transport for the blood. So what you would do then is if I were to set this over here, I would first, before I even you know, take the person's blood, I would go ahead and put some sterile saline on that, right? And let's say I want to run a test. So let me grab some, um, let me grab our vials. And just for demonstration purposes, For demonstration purposes, I'm going to go ahead and put a drop of saline on the, the, uh, the test. Here, let me grab. Well, I could use one of these. Let me just use one of these. I don't need that much. Even though they're used. Well, this is just demonstration. Oh. I'm just demonstrating. We're not going to really do any test oh. on anybody. I just need a little bit of saline. So all I'm going to do is drop a little bit of sterile saline in that little circle there. Okay. And just do this. One handed recap. I'm going to go ahead and throw this in the sharp. So that's enough saline. We're going to give that a minute to seep up the, uh, up the strip. Now, what I'm going to do is test whether or not the positive controls are actually working. So I would need two tests, one for negative, one for positive, wouldn't I? Right. And that's what I have here. This is the fun of working in a lab, because the negative is negative, but the positive is really positive. So the positive HIV can actually cause HIV. They've put They've put the HIV in here so that it shows positive if it comes out. If it, it, so that this is positive. So if this, if this uh, strip is working and it has, you know, good efficacy, everything is working, it's in date, and I put a positive drop of HIV on this, then it's going to show this time two lines on this particular test for HIV is positive.
okay? So two lines is positive, one line is negative, okay? So this one, I think red means dead. Sure, it's just like a gun up is safe, down is, is dead, yeah. See how it's got red, it's got the positive, mm -hmm. the little plus? Uh -huh. Okay, so this is, if you were to stick yourself with this, and you got this in you, I mean, chances are slim, but you could typically give yourself AIDS with some of the, 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 the test controls in the laboratory, okay? So with this one, I would put a drop of this here, and I would let it, I'd wait for 10 minutes. If I see two lines, then I know that the positive control is working, and that this batch sample that I pulled out of the box is also working. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to open it. I'm not, not going to do it. I'm not going to shock you guys in. Spill it. Oh, I spilled it. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. not funny. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We're not going to do that. But you, just to give you an idea. Yeah. So that's how you test controls. There's always a positive. There's always a negative. There's always a high. There's always a low. And you have to use these controls to, to be sure that the batches that you get in from the manufacturer usually are working. So usually it's only one. From one batch, you always test one of the, the tests because it would be, you'd be losing if you were just to grab a test every week because these are expensive. These so are does not that cheap. show also like this one and the negative and the positive? Like if it's the two lines? If it's two, if I put positive HIV on there and it's working, it's going to give me two lines for positive. Right, but I'm saying, does it show the on negative. there just like it did on this one? Yes. Okay. Yes. It'll come out just, just the way it is. Um, now, if you're going to be doing these as a, um, like in a laboratory, as a point of care for the people that are coming in, it's, you really have to deal with the afterward because a lot of people are very nervous. They, they don't want to have to wait, give their name, go to a hospital, you know. They just want to know, am I, right now, am I positive or am I negative? You know, I had a bad night. I did some things I shouldn't have. It's been a week. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I can't live with it anymore. I need to, and, and so you deal not only with the test, but you have to understand the aftermath of what happens. Some people are positive. How do you deal with that? Oh, thank you. Have a nice day. That'll be $70. Oh, my life is destroyed. Or they're negative and they sit and they have to cry for 15 minutes because they're so relieved. But are we allowed to tell them what, what the test results are? Of course, because they could do this on their own. Point of care testing is different than having a doctor's order for a blood draw that you would do in a laboratory and have the lab sent out. If people can pay for the same things that you have in a lab, which is what we call point of care, they have every right to know what their results are. And then we give it to them. You can't. And that's called point of care Without testing. Without us getting in trouble. Correct. Correct. So point of care testing. You can give results. Okay, so when it comes to point of care, point of care testing, you can absolutely present the results. You may present results. Okay, you may present results. Now, this is why, as a, I teach my students to make sure that you've got a, a, a ton of compassion because of situations like these. Okay. You can't just tell somebody, oh, it looks like it's positive, have a nice day. With each of these tests comes a pamphlet about HIV, about this is a preliminary test. Okay, it's positive, but you know what? You need to follow up with your doctor. Anything can happen. Take it one step at a time. Let's follow up now, okay? This could be wrong. Chances are it's not. I did one on someone three times. 
and this person had no emotion. No emotion. It was kind of scary. Wow. And she was only 21. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I, I was so sure I was doing something wrong. I said, no, this can't be. This can't be. This can't be. I, I think I went through three or four tests. I said, can I stick you again? Can I stick you again? She says, yeah. And then, um, you know, I said, well, before I could even sit with her and try to counsel her, uh, you, you use the pamphlet to counsel them, right? Because you have to have consultation after tests like this. I mean, so okay, so somebody's thyroid's high, not a big deal. They need to follow up with their doctor. But if they're positive, that's, that means you're going to take a little time out to sit with this person or give them time alone. Whatever they need from you, you need to provide for them. Um, we've had, I mean, and then, you know, I tried, even when I tried speaking with the patient, they just, they just walked out. Okay. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty heavy duty, right? It's pretty heavy duty. It's not like a hematocrit. It's not like knowing your hemoglobin's below eight. Maybe you're anemic and you can get some iron. It's not like that maybe, you know, you have, uh, you know, your, uh, your white cells are a little high. You might have to be fighting an infection because your neutrophils are high. This is, this is a life-changing event. How long, how long is it for with the HIV? They can actually live very long lives now. There's lots of um, immunoglobulins and there's lots of medication that they can take now to live very full and uh, um, full lives, normal oh, lives. Yeah. He's been positive for what, 20 years? Oh, easy. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, AIDS doesn't mean that you have, you know, a death sentence, but you do have to take into consideration those people that have, you know, <coughs> maybe made mistakes along the line, and they're married, and they have children, okay? And so now it's, it's like hep C. You know, if you're hepatitis C positive, things are going to change in your life, right? Because now your blood is contagious. Um, body fluids, urine, stool, that's contagious. So especially if you're in the infectious disease stage, you know, especially the jaundice stage. Um, do you have any questions so far on any of the tests that we've gone over? They're pretty straightforward, aren't they? Not too hard to do, right? Let me just throw these away and wash my hands real quick. Uh, let's uh, take a break, Dave. Uh, I think you're